First service, I saw my career flash before my eyes because Jim introduced me as your lead pastor, and I thought I was going to get fired by third service. So, uh, but anyway, if we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Nick. I have the opportunity to serve you as our executive pastor here. If we haven't met face-to-face, I really want to meet you and yours face-to-face. I want to know your name. I want to know your story. I want to give you mine because this isn't just spiritual Walmart. This is a family. This is our home. And so I want to get to know you. I don't want to just pass you and just be like, hey, hi, how are you? Like, I want to know you. So anyway, stop me if you want to talk, and we'll be happy to do that. Um, let's just uh, bow our heads and pray real quick before we go further. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for our, our salvation. Thank you for the fact that we can walk every day knowing that we are right with the Father because of everything that you did and nothing that we can do. We come to you with empty hands. We're just praying that you fill us. And we're empty and we're only looking for you and, and what you can do for our spirit. And Holy Spirit, I'm just praying that you open our eyes to see things we've not yet seen before and ears to hear things in new ways that now we understand it. Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you silence my lips from anything that is not from you. And I pray that you cause them to go deaf to anything that is not from you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all. So if you could, get your Bibles or Bible apps out. Go ahead and open up to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We're going to be starting in verse 11. Now, we're not breaking down Ephesians, but we are hitting on the subject of Christian fellowship, community, and what it means. And so Ephesians does give us an insight into what this looks like. And so just to give you guys some uh, context... Uh, the book of Ephesians is classified as a prison epistle. And what that means is that the prophet, uh, the prophet, the apostle Paul wrote this from prison. And so he was writing to the church in Ephesus. And this church is located in what is now modern day Turkey. And what's interesting about this church is that what we do know is that they were a mixed group of people coming from Jew and Gentile, different backgrounds. And so the first reason Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus is to tell them one You are no longer those separate people, but you are one united people under one banner, and that is Christ. But the second reason he wrote this letter is to tell them, now that you are one people under Christ and not your old nationality, ethnicity, whatever you are, you're also not your old self. And so not only is that person next to you now your brother, but you are no longer even you anymore. And so these are the two reasons that Paul writes this. So with that context in mind, let's just go ahead and read together. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and in the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. All right, so we just see in that segment of scripture words like, And mind you, I know it looks like I just showed you a lot, but that was only six verses. And in those six verses, we see these seven things. Equip, built up, unity, fullness, no longer infants, grow and builds. And so we see here is that Christ himself from scripture has given us certain people in certain roles and giftings in our life so that we can do these seven things. And all of them point to us being a better version of ourself in Christ, but while leaning on each other. And so what this means is that we, we've been given each other for the purpose of growing, and we can't do this alone. But if you notice at the end of that scripture, it says, as each part does its work. Now, if my entire body is healthy, but only my hand uh, works, like moves, decides to move, can I get much done? No, I can't. And so what I did not say was I... I have a sick body and only my hand works. What I was saying was my entire body is healthy, but only my hand chooses to operate. And so that's like the body of Christ is that we have so many able and willing Christians that are able and, and, and equipped to build each other up. But some of us refuse to move. Some of us refuse to show up. 
Because the thing is, is a lot of times we show up to church for selfish, selfish reasons. What can I get out of this experience? Instead of remembering that you are a body of Christ, you're a part of his body and you've been equipped with something. And so there's a huge chance that even if you show up on Sunday, the, the sermon may not be for you, but you were built for someone. And so by you showing up with the gifts and the testimony that God has given you, you unselfishly are showing up to a family reunion. And even if you got nothing from me, you're here because you're going to bump into somebody because your story is beautifully tailored to affect them, to draw them into Christ. So this is why you must come. It's not what I can get out of this place, but it's more like out of obedience. Why am I showing up? Because I'm ready to be used. And so this is the attitude we must have when we show up. We see that in the book of Ephesians that it's not that you and I are special on our own, but it's the fact that you and I are operating like conductive wire, that God works through you and I to affect the rest of the world. And so, yes, God is mighty and he can do all things when he wills it, but he chooses to use you and I to affect each other's lives. And so through coming to church, you and I will fill, again, you and I, I'm not doing that on purpose, it's just coming out. You and I help each other feel each other, uh, God's heartbeat for us. We can go home and we can pray to God and be in our room and have a, a relationship with God. That doesn't stop. But he manifests himself in the way his people live together. How we love each other, how we serve each other. If one of us is lacking in grace, he puts another in our life that is full of grace and teaches us this is what it looks like. When we are hard to, to love and love others, he brings people into our life that love us without effort and it teaches us that it's possible. And so you and I have been equipped in a way to where God can use us. And we sense his, his existence just by the way he shows himself through his people, through his creation. And so this is another reason why it's important to be in community, not just show up. This isn't spiritual Walmart. So some of us come from a tight-knit family. And so some of us understand what it's like to have people in our life that will bend over backwards to just make sure that we have everything we need. And even if some of us don't come from those type of families, if you're a Christian, God has blessed you with 2.4 billion brothers and sisters globally. If you zoom in, God has blessed you with 210 million brothers and sisters nationally. And I know it doesn't look like it right now, but remember we have three services, but just at Grace Walk Church, you have nearly 900 brothers and sisters here. And so this, oddly enough, I just thought of this last service. This is part of the reason why some people think I'm an outside hire. Like one day I was not here and then the next I'm on stage. It's that I was among you this entire time for all these years. That's how big our family is, is that some of you guys think that I just got hired and thrown on stage. Like I'm, I'm your brother. I've been here with you this whole time. I've been here with you. But this is our family. I went through growth track with Phoenix and Aaron all these years ago. And so these are the brothers and sisters that I came in with it. No, I've been here. I wasn't just bought at like some spiritual Kmart. Like <laughs> I'm here. I'm with you. I've been with you. But this is why we need each other. Because yes, we connect horizontally. But it's all because it's pointing vertically. This isn't a social club you show up to on Sundays that you get a little bit of recharged in your, your heart and your mind. You're not coming for motivational speech. You're coming to be convicted and shaped into the image of Christ. And so we come here because, and we'll connect with each other this way, but it's all because you and I are shaping each other to point back upwards on an individual one-on-one -on -one with him. And he uses this to get to this. So please, brothers and sisters, where's the, you on the camera, you, you're home and that's great. We're glad that you're watching right now. But I challenge you to step in here because here is where you'll meet these people that you don't even see and they will affect your life. We got JD right here, right? But you won't meet JD unless you come in. So I challenge you guys to come in. But yeah. So let's just look at Hebrews 10, 24, 25. We don't know who wrote Hebrews for sure. We think it's Paul, but long story short, this was written 2000 years ago and I want to have you think to yourself as we read it, does it sound familiar? And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this isn't a 2024 issue. This is a year 24 issue. This issue was happening when Jesus was alive. And so imagine 
Paul is writing to people that even if they didn't meet Jesus themselves face to face, they at least met somebody who did speak to him one on one or touched his, his cloth. And so imagine living in a time and place where you know people that have at least heard one of his sermons live. And those people are even deciding not to show up to church. 2,000 years ago, Paul is writing, telling new Christians, hey, can you stop doing that? Like some of these people are starting to make it a habit of not showing up. They think that it's enough to just pray in their room. Look, we serve a God who is everywhere at all times. And so, yes, you're right. You don't need to come to church to encounter him. But when you come to church, you're able to see what he's doing through people's lives. And we put each other in each other's lives. He put us in each other's lives so that we could be the thing that maybe we're asking for with help or for guidance. And so it's important that you show up. Just, just another thing to, to remember too is, yes, you may be showing up on Sundays and praise God for that. But are you just roommates with your brothers and sisters that are here? And some of us that are in marriages, we understand what it's like to live with our spouse and be married to our spouse, but that's kind of just like that guy who lives in the next room and we share these little people that we made. Like, but other than that, we're just roommates. There's nothing closeness about it. And so don't let the Sunday experience just end on Sunday. When you show up today, guys, I challenge you that if, if we're Christians, this is a lifestyle. This is something that you're plugged into every single day, and it should be effortless. I love my blood family with all of my heart. We have, there's, no, there's not an issue. But I'll tell you right now that my, if it's like those Coca-Cola commercials where they put a straw in a Coke and like a, a store brand one and they try to make you guess which one you're drinking. And it's my, my, my soul doesn't know the difference between you and the mother I came out of. That is how close this needs to be. And it was effortless because all I did was show up and God operated through you guys into me. And so when I put you guys side by side, equally as des everybody's deserving of my life as my mom. So each one of you I would die for equally and it's effortless because you are mine and I'm yours. And this is what it looks like when you show up, not to just receive something, but you're showing up for an experience that you're getting ready to grow and you don't know how. And people want growth to happen here and now, but they forget that it takes years. It takes years of growth. I'm not the person that walked into these doors the first time, but it's because I continually showed up and he did too. And he used you guys to raise me. And I'm doing the same for you. And this is what I'm calling you guys to do, that this is not just a thing you show up on Sundays. This is a family reunion. Look around. If there's a face that you haven't met yet, you're going to shake their hand and say your name. And I guarantee keep at that for the next year and see where that relationship is. But you have to be intentional. It's not just something that happens. Let me go back because I'm really getting ahead of myself. But All right, so we see in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we see that Jesus is in a house and he's teaching his disciples. And around his disciples, he has other people who are behind them listening to his message. But now we're outside the house and there's people wrapping around the house trying to peek their head into this house and hear the lesson. So we have these layers and distance away from Christ. And outside of that crowd, there's a man who's paralyzed. And scripture never says that he asked for help. He never reached out. But we see that brothers saw him and took initiative to lift him up without him asking and take him towards the house because they knew what he was in need of and they knew what Christ could do. And so this man just kind of like left it. He was just like, all right, this is my life. That's cool. I mean, I'll try to hear what I can from this distance. But other than that, this is just what I am. But his brothers saw him and it took that small community to take him up to the house. But when they encountered the house, they too saw that crowd. And so what this speaks to is that even if you and I come alongside of each other to help each other in issues, we're still gonna, we're still gonna encounter that crowd. But we bear each other's burdens. And so they picked up their brother and that crowd that he would have reached with no legs, he's now reached with brothers as he's on their shoulders. But because they came in together as a community and they bore his burden, they lifted this man onto the roof of the house that Jesus was in because they knew, look, it wasn't enough just to even slide this man through the window and hope he got close enough to Jesus' feet. We need to get our brother to the middle of it all. And so not only do they get to the roof, they cut a hole in the roof. And they didn't just lower him close enough to Jesus, they lowered him to Christ's feet. 
And so this is what it looks like. When we see each other in need, even if we don't see them asking for help, our community here knows our brother is off. Some of you guys are very good. Nick, are you okay? Something seems off. Hey, you're right, and I'm not okay. Thanks for catching me on that. Now, help lead me towards where I need it. And so they lower him. And not only does this brother receive physical healing, but more importantly, he received forgiveness from Christ himself because his brothers got him to the middle of it all. I challenge you guys, if you're at the church right now, but just very unengaged, maybe you're the crowd outside of the house. Maybe you're just engaged enough to try to see what you can see from outside the window. And maybe, maybe you're in the church, but maybe you're still a little unengaged. So maybe you're the people sitting behind the disciples. But I guarantee that if you stay plugged in with intentionality about knowing your brother and sister who's besides you, that you will be at Jesus' feet as well. And it doesn't make one Christian better than the other, but what it does is it strengthens the relationship you have with our God because you've come and plugged in and he's, he's used your brother and sister to grow you and raise you. So I challenge you guys to get into the middle of it all. Our, uh, Dr. Tony Evans said, um, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And you're right. But you also don't need to go to go back home to be married, but stay away long enough and see what that does to your relationship. And so when, it talk, when I'm talking about that, I'll leave you guys with that because that was strong enough on its own. Um, so th this thing about fellowship, it's not a Christian fairy tale. We didn't just make it up that we should come together and, and be tight. It, we're reflecting our God because we come from a communal God. We see in Genesis that the Godhead created all things. John 1, 1 says that Jesus not only was with God, but he was God and that he created all things. We see that before the earth took form, the spirit of God was over the waters. And we see the father operating as the architect of it all. So God himself, although one God in three persons, operates as a community in order that in each of those roles, creation could come together in the way that it needed to be. Similar to how you guys, even though we serve one God, operate in different ways to bring his will about. And so what I'll tell you is that it, it's not a made-up thing that we made up. It's, it's a template off of our God. We see that after every step of creation, you know, God creates vegetation and fish. After every step, he's saying, it is good. It is good. But there's one component of his creation that we find that God for the first time says, it is not good. And when he created Adam, he says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And so if we zoom in, this was about Adam the man needing a wife perfectly fit for him. And if you notice, God perfectly created humanity to where we complement each other. We were different enough to where we can operate, but different enough to where we could also support each other where we're weak at. And this is the beauty of the body of Christ is that right now there's so many different languages, skills, backgrounds, and testimonies sitting right here that when we come together, we complement each other. And so God perfectly created us for this. And he, he started off with two separate people. And on the smallest scale, God said, it is not good that man be alone. In Hebrew, man was just Adam, his name. But Adam also means mankind. And so when God was speaking, he was speaking for everything. It is not good that this species be alone. There, there has to be more of them. And so God, before we even fell, God commands us to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And so from the beginning of time, God has given us a mission that we should grow and control and take dominion over, uh, take dominion over the entire world. And so we see for the first time, God creates Eve. And mind you, before Eve was even created, Adam had just got finished naming every creature that was ever created. So he saw the platypus and named that, and the giraffe. And I don't want to be controversial, but he saw the stegosaurus, and he was like, that's a stegosaurus, right? <laughs> so, but what I, what I will say, though, is that out of all the beautiful creatures God has created on earth, Adam named every single one of them, but for the first time, his jaw drops, and he's just like, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He's realized for the first time that the thing standing before him is like him, but is also not, but knows enough about him already to where he knows now he is known. So he looks at her and says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. What this really saying is Adam has realized for the first time the special feeling of knowing 
and being known. Each and every one of us wants to be known. I think the ugliest feeling is passing somebody and not acknowledging them because it kind of feeds into the fact that like, hey, you're just a face here. That's why I'm super big on getting to know you guys. And if I pass you, I'm not being rude. I'm just in the zone. But it's super important that we get to know each other, guys. It's, it's the fact that we're known and being known. And I love being vulnerable with you guys because that's letting you know, hey, you can have all of me. I'm not a bag of secrets. You can have it all. But go ahead and give me some of you too because I want to know who I'm talking to. I want to know what God has in you that he's sent you into my life to help me with and vice versa. And so for the first time we see man realize that he's not alone, that something is like him. So this grow and control thing didn't cease after we sinned against God. We see in Genesis 3.15, after the serpent sins against God, God is issuing the serpent his rightful punishment. And what he tells the serpent is this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so when people think of the gospel, they don't think of this. They think of like the four books that start the New Testament and like talking about just Jesus' sacrifice. And while that is a gospel, which just means good news, this was the first good news ever given. Our Bible is 66 books, and in just chapter 3, God gives us the good news. Hey, look, you messed up. You're going to strike their heel, but they're going to crush your head. And so what this gospel was talking about was the promise of Christ to come. That's why it's in the singular. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And so that, in Genesis, Jews think we made this up. Some Jews that haven't come over to the Jesus side. They think we made up Jesus, but we can see in just chapter 3, in the singular, we're promised that a Messiah will come and crush the enemy's head even after he himself is damaged. And we saw that. Jesus died and stayed in the grave for three days. That was his heel being struck. But the enemy's head was crushed when our Savior beat sin and death and came back to life on the third day. On the larger scale, though, the woman's offspring will be responsible for this. While Abraham was an offspring of Eve... And in Galatians, we learned that if we believe in Jesus, that we're a seed of Abraham. Therefore, we're not only just biologically related to Eve, because if you believe in science, you must admit that that's the truth, but also that we're spiritually connected to her. And us as her offspring, our Christ did it first, but now together, even when we are damaged, we will pick each other up because when one falls, the other will pick the other up, but we will use each other to push back darkness and crush its head because we have each other. So in, in Matthew 16, 18, uh, just to give some context real quick, um, including myself, some of us previous Catholics thought that this verse was supporting the fact that Peter is the Pope, and that's not true. Let me give you some context. So Jesus asked his disciples, hey, what are people saying? Like, who do they say that I am? And they give the answer. And so Jesus asked his disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And so Simon Peter answers and says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. So... Keep that part in mind, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The rock is the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. Based off of that firm foundation and that truth, he will build his church. And after his church is built, Jesus promises violence on the enemy by saying the gates of hell will not overcome it. I know we don't speak this way anymore. But sometimes it leads us to think that they won't overcome us. And while that is true also, you don't have to be an architect or in the military to know that gates are not offensive weapons. It's defensive and nobody's walking around smacking each other with gates. It's it's meant to be defensive. And so Jesus is promising violence on the enemy and saying that the gates of hell can't hold us back. But it's us together. Look, I want you to understand that this is such a solid truth that a computer came up with that picture when I typed in, uh, create an image of Christians beating down the gates of hell. And it created that. And so a mindless, soulless piece of technology knows that that's the violence that is promised on the enemy. And so we have us in armor. I just wish he was holding a sword, but we have us in armor supporting each other, beating down these gates. And so the promise is not that if it's gonna happen, the gospel, And Genesis 3.15 says it is going to happen. We are going to crush its head. And Jesus says, as long as they're standing on the truth that I'm the Messiah 
and I'm the son of God, these gates will not hold us back. We will overwhelm it. And so I just want to do a, a flash. So I only got about five minutes, but I'm, I'm going to tell you guys the ministries that I got into when I first got here that affected me in the order that they came, right? So it's not that one's special than the other. I'm literally just telling you what community means to me and what it created. So my wife and I first came to Grace Walk Church and I was a fresh believer. I was an agnostic who was just fresh off of trying to disprove the fact that God is even real in the first place. And we found this place and called it home in two weeks. And in two weeks, it, it took brothers and sisters to come alongside us and say, look, we love you. And we see that God has called you to something, but you're not living right. You're not married with each other. And so I was shook. I was like, you're telling me I can't have my girlfriend and just be a Christian and, and we can't just live together? Like that's, and so it took brothers and sisters older in age and experience than me to lovingly pull me to the side and say, hey, like God has something for you, but you're not living right. And so I submitted myself. And so Kevin and Melanie Crumbly, they were our first, they, they were our premarital counselors. Kevin and Melanie took us under their wing and, and they got us ready for marriage. But I'll tell you this though, after we got marriage, uh, marriage, married, we were starting to do things God's way technically, but our marriage was a hot mess. I'll tell you guys right now, out of six out of, uh, six out of seven days of the week, my wife and I were going to fight. 22 out of 24 hours, we were going to be fighting. We were dogs to each other and she doesn't get offended when I say that because it is the truth. My marriage was a hot mess. And so I say that to give glory to God, but we ran back to Melanie and Kevin and they were our premarital counselors, but then they turned into our actual marriage counselors and we came under their wing. And that's what community is, that God wants your marriage. He wants it to fall apart and he wants it to look different than what he's asked it to be. But when you come under brothers and sisters, that community raises you up. I have the opportunity now to be married to my best friend, but it wasn't always like that. And it took a community of marriage believers uh, to, to, take us under their wing and teach us to the point where we ourselves became the directors of marriage ministry years later. These are your new marriage ministry directors, Jesus and Regina Santana. If you, if you guys want premarital counseling, counseling, or you just want to be in fellowship with other married couples, I suggest that you get in touch with them. They're on our Facebook page. They're on our, our website. Just get plugged in. It's a beautiful community. Next. When my wife got saved, we, we knew what it generally meant to be a Christian, but she didn't know what it meant to be a Christian woman. And so she got pulled into women's ministry. And those sisters who were older in the faith and in age brought her under their wings and they taught her what it looked like to be a biblical wife, mother, and woman. And so these women did what the Bible asks and they raised my wife up to be a Christian woman. So if you want to join the women's ministry, it's a powerful, powerful ministry that meets the second Saturday of every month here. And they're about to go on a retreat right now. That, that's closed, but we'll see you next year. Yeah. See Alicia Cruz. She's our director of women's ministry. Next, we have Brian Wedgworth. Now, Brian Wedgworth, early on in my faith, I knew also what it looked like generally to just be a Christian. But... Brian has been doing Maximize Men curriculum for the last forever, every Tuesday. And because of Brian and his effort in pouring into me, he taught me how, uh, through this curriculum, how to be a Christian, a Christian man, a Christian husband, and a Christian father. And he poured into me. And it was through his investment in my soul that I am partly what I am today because it keeps going. Other people are responsible for my growth. So see Brian if you want to join Maximize Men. Next, we have Roger Garcia. Now, Roger Garcia is the director of men's ministry. For the, uh, for the, yeah. Every first Saturday of the month, men's ministry meets right here. Men's ministry was the first place that I found out that it's not a feminine thing to raise your hand and praise God in full submission to him as you praise him. Men's ministry taught me that. Men's ministry also showed me that it's okay for men to not be okay and to cry on each other's shoulders as we point each other to Christ. Men's ministry raised me. Also, Bri uh, Ro uh, Roger, my bad, pre-workout. Um, Roger has been doing the same Bible study at his house for the past 12 years every Wednesday that I attend. And I'll just tell you right now, 
Guys, as a pastor, it's super powerful to walk into one of my brother's homes without any title and just being a Christian man and sit at my brother's feet as they pour into me. That is so beautiful to just be a brother, and he does that. So if you want that information too, see Roger every Wednesday for the past forever. So <laughs> next, we have Pastor Don, Celebrate Recovery. So yeah. When I first got saved, my wife and I, we were just angry, angry animals, angry. And, and again, this isn't offensive because we, we glorify the fact that we were weak because it showed how strong he is. But I was one of the most angriest people you could ever meet in your life. And I don't know if you guys get that from me or whatever, but if I said something to you or did something to you, it's because you earned it and there is no apology coming from me, right? And so I was just a dog and, and just angry. Like I... I I was drunk off my anger. That's the only way that I could put it. So we went to celebrate recovery because my wife needs help. And <laughs> so no, we actually went to celebrate recovery silently. I'll tell the truth. Yes, we went there because I was like, she needs it more than I do. But we ended up both taking the 12 step program at the same time. And we became graduates from that. And it's through celebrate recovery that we were surrounded with a community of people that don't wear this mask, mask to church. Sometimes we walk in and we have this like, yes, I'm blessed and highly favored. Like, no, walk in on a Friday and someone will tell you that it's not okay when you ask them. It's beautiful because it's a community of people that admit something is wrong with me and I don't know what it is, but God can help. And we come together. Just on Friday, I just got my four-year coin. And so it's something that I still do. So you guys find this community. All right, I'm already in trouble because I'm over. But we have Sister Deidre. Now, when mama can't hold the baby for too long because we're busy, because my wife and I are still over at student ministry, we give our baby to Deidre. So from like nursery uh, through, through grave, like there's a place for you here at Grace Walk Church from the time you're born until the time you're buried, like we have something for you. And so we keep going and we have Jeremy from Kids Church, him and his wife, Yanni. Yeah. So come back next week. Uh, Jeremy's actually the one giving the, the sermon next week, but Jeremy and I have this cool relationship where we, where we switch sons. He takes my seven-year-old and I take his 14-year-old at student ministry. And we, we trust each other to raise each other's sons. And so this is just this weird dynamic in a Christian community where like we're giving each other our kids because we understand that we ourselves don't have it all, but that next person can. And so please pour into my baby. All right, cool. And I'll pour into yours. And so this is how it starts is when we plug our kids in, our teenagers in, it might not look like nothing now. But this is what it looks like when we allow each other to be sharpened from grave, uh, birth to grave. This is what it looks like. So anyway, I, I'm going to end it with this. <laughs> None of this happened just because it happened. I'll tell you right now, two weeks into being here at Grace Walk Church, um, a, a growth track uh, announcement came up. And this isn't a growth track commercial. But what I will say is that I didn't just find these people by accident. What happened was me and my wife went through growth track with Phoenix and Aaron, right? And we were plugged into ministries to where, yes, we're serving somewhere on Sunday that makes Sunday services run well. By the way, thank you guys, praise God for all of your lives that help keep Sundays going. But it's initially by being plugged into those small teams by going to growth track that we met the people that we met, that we were able to be connected and grow in the way that we needed to grow. It didn't happen just showing up on Sundays. I don't know what my life would look like if Sunday was just all my faith was all these years but we got plugged in. And because we got plugged in, other people's plugged us in. And so guys, I challenge you now, if not this growth track, sign up for the next one because that's where it really starts. And, and look, it, it's not about the task that needs to be done. We're, we're serious that growth track is about who you can meet because God is gonna make you run into somebody who he's pre-wired to run into your life and affect you in the way that you need to be affected. So, um, that's my biggest challenge to you guys. Find a face that you haven't said hi to yet. Find names, histories. Just get to know each other. Or sit here on Sundays and just look back in 10 years and ask yourself, why haven't I grown? Why haven't I changed? Why don't I have a big family of believers that I can lean on? And then we can look back. I'll throw my arm over your shoulder and say, well, what have you done for the past couple of years? Where have you been? So I'm already over, but... That's, that's my biggest challenge to you guys. Get plugged in. Don't just be here. This isn't spiritual Costco. Like, don't let what I say to you just be what you receive and then you walk out. 
God wired you to, to affect somebody's life. So um, let's just bow our heads real quick. All right, in this time, um, like if you're just tired of living the life that you're living, that, that you don't fully understand what Christ did for you, but you understand at the minimum that he saves you or has the power to, but you want to give your life to him and you want to start new. You want to have a new life that you never had before. Would you raise your hand if you want to give your life to Jesus? Praise God. Drop your hands. All right, because we're coming together as a community, I want us all to say this prayer together so that our brothers and sisters that just raised their hand don't feel alone. We're going to say this together. And it's not that the, the prayer we're about to say is magical in itself, but if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the words we're about to say, the Bible says that you will be saved. So we're going to pray this together. Ready? Father God, thank you for my life. I'm a sinner in need of saving. I can't save myself. I believe Jesus can save me. I submit my life to Jesus and no one else. Change me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and bring me a whole new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys would stand up, let's say our verse together.